so we're actually within the church, so it works out really well. Um, I have still some sign-ups. I will probably come around and ask you if you would please like to participate in different areas. Um, I have quite a few areas filled, uh, but we still have some other games that need to be filled. Uh, oh, and we are having snow cones, and we are having waffle cakes, also on top of the hot dogs. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, on Saturday, July 23rd is the men's meeting, the making of a man of God. Please do not forget to sign up online. Do not forget to sign up online. And t-shirts. We have the sign-up sheet for t-shirts. Next weekend will be the last chance to sign up to get a t-shirt because we have to get the order in because I do believe it takes like seven days to get to get the t-shirts and would hate to have them not arrive on time for the event. Oh, if, every, if anybody wants an ever present, we used to have, yeah, we, used, we have it on the back of our car. An ever present church bumper sticker, these are $3 and we can order these as well. What's nice about Vistaprint is we don't have to order mass amounts. You can order one, two, three. It's not like where you have to order 100 to get a good price. So if you'd like that, just let us know for that. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pray and open up the service. And let's just get in position to praise our God and worship our God. and. We were talking the other day, and this is, this is our time to really just come into the throne room. I don't know about you all, but for me personally, this is the time where I kind of get all the funk and junk off of me that may have accumulated on me, because I try to get into that worship and ask the Lord to just get me set free from whatever I may have on me from the week, and to feel a little bit more freedom, and to have that spiritual uplift that I need. So let's get ready and let's get prepared to worship. So Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord God, for every member of Ever Present Church, Lord God. We thank you for all the blessings, Lord God, that each and every one of us have. May we just sing from our hearts and, and may you just refresh us today, Lord God, as we enter into the praises, Lord God. May we worship you. May we glorify your name today. And all the saints said, amen. Those obstacles from them because he knows the desires of his children's heart. So let's just give the Lord another round of applause. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I, I second the motion, the word, because I really sensed the breakthrough and I sensed that, that there was people in here just, we bring some, some, don't we bring our struggles and some of our anxieties and some of our trials, don't we, to church? I mean, we should. And we can lay them down at the feet of, of Jesus. But sometimes we come all pumped up and on fire. Amen. That's when you can pour out on others around you. But there's always a group or an individual or people in a church, no matter the size, that are hurting and that need that extra, you know, touch from the Lord. So, hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, before I start, I know she held up this bumper sticker. And it's a pretty big one. So, it kind of challenged me, you know, putting it on our black car because it was so big and white. I didn't know should it go on a window or, or what, but who else would be bold enough to put one of these on their car? One, taker. Two, my first two takers on the, each end of the room, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. We happen to have two, so, well, I saw you first. You, here, you can do what you want with it. <laughs> if you want to give it away, go ahead, and there's one more in the bag for Nancy. Today. Nah. If you, and if you order a shirt, we'll just get some bumper stickers. So if you want one, you can get, we'll, we'll order them from the church, you know, and give you one. All right, so we'll order a stack of those. I like the new little logo or whatever we call it. You got to bear with me this morning about a year ago. You guys remember when I was having a dry mouth problem? Did you, you remember that? When I was like, <laughs> and I, I thought it was some kind of demonic attack. And <laughs> turns out it was a different form of demonic attack called pharmakia. Um, there was a medicine that I was taking at night that would linger in to the morning, and last night I had to take a little muscle relaxer, and I took a half of one, and, and right as I swallowed, I went, oops, it's going to give me dry mouth in the morning. So lo and behold, I've got some good dry mouth this morning, <laughs> praise God, so we're going to have to work through that. Thank you, Lord, you are the, the living water. 
At least I figured it out, though. Amen? Amen. If you would turn in your devices and Bibles to Exodus 32, this morning's message, as we were sitting down last week and Pastor Michelle got up to preach, um, the, the Holy Spirit spoke to me in regards to making gods. And before she even spoke on love and, and you were talking about the world system and people making their own standards and that kind of thing and what, you know, what is love and the, all them kinds of questions, um, the Lord spoke to me about making gods. And so that's the title of my message this morning. And we're going to look at, I've got kind of a three-point message with a closing. That's <laughs> what most preachers learn in Bible college, but I didn't go to Bible college, hallelujah. So this is a three-point Holy Ghost message with a closing. But we're going to look at three different forms of idols. And I think that as we explore this and kind of open the, the Word of God and take a look at it, you probably, like myself, will look at a couple of them and say, I've never done that. But hopefully by the time we get to the last one, you might find room in there for you to think, man, I might be guilty of doing that or have done that in the past. And it might open our hearts and our understanding a little bit to see where we may be exalting things before our God. Amen? And we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. So this is a very, very familiar story, preached many a times by myself and maybe Pastor Michelle, I don't know, but many preachers. We preach a lot. Uh, it's, it's in the Exodus, and it's in regards to uh, the children of Israel and, and Moses going up on the mount to receive the Ten Commandments. Did I tell you where it was? Exodus 32. Exodus 32, 2 through 6. Hallelujah. And a little backstory to the story, because we're not going to read it all. Moses had gone up onto the mount to meet with God. And it was when he was receiving the commandments on the stones, as we know as the Ten Commandments. And I think we're all very familiar with this story. Moses, though, however, had gone up, and he was up for a while. And the children of Israel, fresh out of bondage, not having a lot of root in themselves, not having a lot of understanding, I think, of, of the Lord, and not having a lot of covenant, uh, got weary rather quickly. We read about it all the time. The children of Israel would get weary quickly. And they didn't know what had become of Moses. They thought perhaps he died on the mountain or some, something, maybe he got wounded. Who knows? They didn't know if he was coming back. And so they pleaded with Aaron about making themselves a god. Now, in Egypt, you need to understand that they worshipped gods and demigods and demons and idols, and they had erected all kinds of different statues, or we'll call them idols, and they would worship these actual uh, statues, I guess, and idols. I mean, I don't know what, any other word to, to call it. And so it was kind of like second nature for the children of Israel when they left out of there even though they knew God and they saw all of the power of God as they were delivered out of Egypt, they were falling back into their old ways, into some old habits. Anybody ever fall back into some old habits and some old ways? And so they approached Aaron and they said, can you make us a God? And so we'll pick up here in Exodus 32, verse 2. It says, And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which are in their ears, and they brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool, and he made a molded calf. The golden calf. We're very familiar, right? Then they said, they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Wow. So it's one thing for us to backslide and to pull back and go back maybe and slip into our old ways and to do things. But these guys slipped so far back that they made a, a, an engraved image out of earrings, out of material, and they actually declared that this was the God who delivered them out of Egypt. They were so desperate to have a God and so desperate to have a leader, this is what they did, wondering what had become of Moses. And then they said, I, I read that. This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord, the Lord being this calf. <laughs> and then they arose early on the next day, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. 
And the people sat down to eat and drink, and then they rose up to play. It's very fascinating to me that people could do what these guys were doing right here. I mean, you got to remember seeing a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of smoke by day, seeing the Red Sea separated, and they crossed all of their children, all of their livestock, crossed on dry ground and watched the Egyptians be swallowed up by the waters as God sent them back. And here they are making an, an image, uh, an engraved image and making an altar before it and saying, this is the God who delivered us out of Egypt. And we're going to celebrate tomorrow with peace offerings and we're going to have a breakfast and then we're going to rise up and we're going to play skip bow or something. I don't know, horseshoes. And we're going to have ourselves a jolly good time. Well, you know, this didn't go over well with God. And Moses was still obviously up on the mountain and God, he heard a noise down in the camp. And he says, that sounds like the sound of war. And God is like, that's not the sound of war. That's the sound of sin. You need to get down there. And so skipping down to verse 22, same chapter, it says, Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. Now, got to fill in the gap. Moses came down with the Ten Commandments in his hands, the two tablets, and he was livid, if you want to say it that way. And he threw them and smashed them, and he broke them. And he was so disappointed in the children of Israel. And so he's confronted, he's confronting his associate pastor. He's confronting Aaron and saying, what happened? I, I was only gone for a couple of weeks. I was only gone for a number of days. And this is what you do. You, you melt down all the metals and create a golden calf and put an altar before it. And you begin to worship it. What's going on here? And so Aaron said, do not let your anger, do not let the anger of the Lord become hot. You know the people. And I, I, I come on. Every one of us, as we read down these next couple chapters, we should be able to fit ourselves in just a little bit with the blame shifting that we're going to read here and, and the excuses that we're going to see here. You know these people, they are an evil people. They're stiff-necked people and they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, mistake number one, Moses did not bring them up out of the land of Egypt. God brought them up. And what happened, I think, in this story is they, their, their vision was, was small. And yes, it, we, we need to follow leaders. We need to follow pastors. We need to have people that would go before us. But always remembering that God is your God no matter. Man will always let you down. Pastors will let you down. Preachers, evangelists, apostles, they'll let you down. But God will not let you down. And his word is sure and his faithfulness is from generations to generations and our God will never let you down. So don't fall into the trap that the, Egypt, or the Israelites did here. They got their eyes off of Moses or off of God and onto Moses thinking that Moses was their deliverer. For as for this Moses, this man that brought us up out of the land, we don't know what has become of him. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let him break it off. And so they gave it to me and I cast it into the fire and this calf came out. Now, I love this story because I, I know that all of us, if we really can think of some story in our past where maybe we got caught by our wife, Daniel, doing something we weren't supposed to. Maybe, maybe our supervisor at work is calling us to the carpet because we did something off or maybe just a friend or I don't know, whatever the story is in your life. And we get called out. And so we begin to make these excuses. Well, they, they brought their gold to me, and so I took it, and I threw it into the fire, but and a calf jumped out. We just read earlier that he took engraving tools, and he smelted and melted and took that gold and molded it into a golden calf, and then he actually took tools to engrave it. So it wasn't just it got thrown into the fire and a calf leaped out. But we want to always make things sound bigger than they were, like, well, you don't understand, Moses. They brought me their gold and I threw it in and this golden calf just jumped out and it felt like it was a God of some sort. Like it was, it was an aha moment, like God was speaking to us and so we thought we were to worship it. Excuses and excuses. Expand on, expound on your story to make it sound more glorious and bigger than it is to try to convince somebody else that truly maybe this was the Lord and not just something that they were doing. And so I love that story because it's a classic story of an idol, of something that they built. And I, I for, for one, have never erected, I would say, a physical 
idol that I don't, I don't think I have. Maybe we've had necklaces. I've got some bracelets on now. I don't worship them. But maybe in our life, we did have something that we had a lot of meaning in it or we put a lot of stock into. Some people wear crucifixes around their necks. And they, they feel like if they don't have it on, that they're going to be cursed or get killed that day. Like, they really put some superstition into these things. You know, have you ever met anybody like that? And so we got to be careful that we're not erecting idols in our lives. Number two, the second idol I'd like to talk about is in the form of people over our lives, like rock stars, uh, idols, musicians, even preachers sometimes, leaders, um, it doesn't matter, but any person that you are fond of, that it's okay to aspire and to see somebody who you believe is a good leader or they've got some characteristics that you admire in them and you want to be like them a little bit. You know, I'm like that with my pastor a little bit. And there was a time when I think there was almost a little worship in me. Uh, I was really, I really wanted to be like him because 30 years ago when he'd come to church, the, the power of God was so strong on his life that I, I really admired him almost to a fault, a little too far. And that's not why my hair has come like his. <laughs> I found this on my own, I think. But um, anyway, anybody ever, when they were young, where'd Cody go? There he is. Anybody, when they were young, ever look up to rock stars? I know when I was a teenager, Ozzy Osbourne, I know, Metallica and all them, but Ozzy was my idol. I liked all the heavy metal music, but for some reason I really looked up to Ozzy, I have no idea why. I was a teenager, young and kind of dumb. But it says here, I just wrote something down. It says, every person in this world is unique and hence one should live life the way it suits him. Idolizing any other person pulls us away from our own needs and desires as we try to imitate the other person in every aspect. We should understand that no person is perfect. Even if the other person is happy, it is because he or she is following a path that suits them. The same path need not provide fulfillment for us. Amen. For us. I remember a word that I got years ago when we were in a, prof like a prophetic school, learning how to walk in those gifts. <clears throat> and a prophet came to me and said something along those very words, that you need to get your eyes off of other preachers, that I was really fashioning my, my gifting or what I thought was in me after somebody else. And we can fall trapped to that, trying to preach like somebody else, trying to act like someone else, trying to live like someone else, trying to talk like somebody else. And so we got to remove those idols out of our life. Amen. Number three, this is the one I think that if we don't have little constructed idols in our lives and we don't have people idols in our lives, and maybe you can find yourself in this category. Making God fit your beliefs and your desires. Now, I want to take a look at the LGBTQ+, plus, is that right? LGBTXYZ+, plus movement, whatever it is today. There's a lot of letters there. But I want to look at them and pick on them only because they're on the forefront of civilization and our culture and what's going on in our world. And I know there's other people groups, groups that could fit into this, but I'm going to use them for an example. Has anyone ever heard the slogan or have you recently on social media or on the news? Hey, by the way, Roe versus Wade. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think that's amazing. It's exciting. And then I guess there was some other um, ruling on carrying guns or concealed weapons in New York yep. that there was some laws that were unlawful according to the second commandment or, or second commandment second amendment <laughs> preaching from the United States I'm going to get this right nonetheless hallelujah Lord we thank you Amen. and uh, who knows I just I'm looking forward to the show because who knows what's going to happen over the next few days I didn't I didn't watch the news this morning did any cities get burned down Anything like that? No? No, one's, no one knows? All right, because I, I know before, you know, the burning city is just when Trump was in office, so I figured they would melt everything with this going on. But they're holding, they're holding their peace somehow. Amen. We'll see how long that lasts. But anybody ever heard the slogan or the saying, or this is their saying, love is love. Yeah. Love is love. And this is what we hear a lot right now in our, in our culture and in our world. Love is love. This week, and... Uh, I put a post, well, actually I put a couple posts on Facebook and the last one I put 
I'll explain near the end of this message. It was a little deep, but it was too deep and confusing, and I don't know if people understood it, so I'll clarify it a little. But at the beginning of the week, I put a post called, What is Love? And I put a picture, you know, with a heart. And uh, it was received fairly well by some people, and then a little bit of a discussion arose with uh, somebody I know, a friend, friend's friend, friend's daughter here in the church. And... uh, she come at me with this very thing. Well, I don't understand. Why is it so hard to just believe that love is love and that men can love men and women can love women? And it really opened up an opportunity for me to kind of put out some of the scriptures and kind of try to explain, you know, what love really is. Excuse me. Now, a couple of weeks back or maybe a couple months ago, we remember we preached on the different names for love, agape, phileo, and eros. Do you remember those teachings? And we know that agape is a God kind of love. It is, it is, it's, an, it's a love that we can experience from God. And agape is a love that would lay its life down for another, but it's a God kind of love. It's a sacrificial love. It is a supernatural God love. Okay? So we can love people with agape. And then we have phileo, which is where we get the city of Philadelphia, the, bro, the, the, the city of love, or, or brotherly love, excuse me, the city of brotherly love. Phileo is brotherly love. And that's the kind of love that, yes, a man could love a man. That means, what's up, bro? I love you. Aaron, I got your back. If we're in battle or even just if we're at work doing a roof, I got your back. You fall off, I'll try to catch you. But I love you. <laughs> All right? That's, that's a brotherly love. But eros is a romantic, sensual, even almost to the point of lust kind of love. I am not eros in my brother Aaron. Okay? I'm, I'm just phileo him. I, I love you, Aaron, but not in the arrows. You know. <laughs> and so this is where it gets confusing. So in my studies, when I was writing back to this person, it said that in the Greek language, there's actually eight words for love. Now, Jesus targeted these three. So we, we, seem, we seem to know these three as preachers and from the Bible, and these are the ones that he used in the Greek. But there's actually eight words. I did not go into study on those. But I wanted to explain that There are different kinds of love and how we can love one another, but it is against nature, we all know this, for a man to be with a man and for a woman to be with a woman. But in our culture today, it's it's embraced, it's celebrated, it's Pride Month. They want us to embrace it. In the church, the church is the final frontier for this group. And that's why... They don't understand why, why won't you just accept it? Why is it so hard for you to understand this? Why can't you just allow it to sink into your mind? Because I can't. Because it goes against everything that I know and every fiber of my existence because God, the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ is living and breathing on the inside of me. And I know that he is the truth and he is the way that leads me to God and God is love. And the only way for us to fully understand love is to come to God so that we can learn about it and to learn about his love. And we can only do that through Christ. Now, as we look at people who are trying to create things to fit their lives, Pastor Michelle taught a little bit about it last week. She says people are making their own rules. They're making their own laws. They're making their own truths today. And the scary thing about that is how can I make my own truth? Well, love is love. Can't you just see that we can all love one another? Can't we just allow people to be who they are, to each their own? That's another saying that I hate very much, to each their own, because that's a very selfish saying that says, I won't judge you, I won't condemn you as long as you don't judge me and condemn me. But they're missing the whole idea behind all manner of love, because if I love you, I'm going to be compelled to share the truth with you. If you're in some kind of error or in some kind of sin, I have to let you know, because I'm concerned about your eternal security. I'm not concerned about the earthly realm and what's going on down here. Now, this love, love is love thing that they're talking about is earthly, it's sensual, and it's demonic. The Bible talks about it. Men of debased minds. People who would have all of their focus on this plane out here. They don't have any thought. I don't believe this, this group of people puts a lot of stock and a lot of thought into the eternal realm or God or where am I going after I die. They really just want to have love here and have it now. The scary thing about it, 
excuse me, is that while they're in pursuit of being accepting to all groups and accepting to all ways of living, they're actually undermining and stepping on truth. Now we know Jesus is the way and he is the truth and he is the life. And I wrote this second thing on Facebook that said, in order to fully understand love, you have to have truth. You have to come to know truth. And you'll never understand love without truth because truth is Jesus and love is God. Amen. We'll never get to God without Jesus because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And the two go hand in hand. And so we can't pretend that we love people and that we're going to accept them where they're at and never call them to the carpet and say, hey, you're missing the mark. Hey, you're in sin. Hey, I'm concerned about your life. Because I'm, if I do that, I'm undermining the ultimate truth. If I would even argue there's only one truth. That's it. Truth, period. There is no other truths under truth. There's telling the truth, but there's one truth. And it cannot be undermined. It cannot be taken away from. Now, we, I know Christians who are doing the same thing that people are doing in the world right now. I know particular Christians that they don't go to this church, so don't worry. I'm not pointing anybody out. And don't start thinking, who's, who's pastor talking about? <laughs> but I have friends who are Christians. And I'm going to pick on uh, this, this individual and and I've known him, sorry, I said him, so now I've narrowed it down to a him. But I've known a couple of individuals, him or her, that have been Christians for many, many years. And they can't give up smoking cigarettes. Remember, I was a smoker. It was the hardest thing I ever quit. But the Lord, the same spirit that raised Christ from dead that's in you, that's in me, that's in this guy, I know by the spirit that he's telling him, you need to give that up because it's a hurtful habit. I would go as far as to say it's sinful because the Bible says that he who destroys the temple of God, God himself will also destroy. What's he talking about? He wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about yeah. you and I. We are building blocks and we're putting together as a place for God to dwell in the spirit. And so he doesn't want us harming or hurting the temple that he dwells in. And so these people think like this. This is how I figure they do it because I've kind of justified things in my own life. I think we all have. I hope you have. If you haven't, I think you're lying to yourself. <laughs> well, I go to church twice a week. I go on Wednesday and I go on Sunday. I don't watch X-rated movies. I don't even watch R-rated movies. I don't even like violence or cussing. I make sure that my life is clean. I read my Bible in the morning and at night. I do devotionals. I spend time in prayer with my wife. I spend time in prayer with my kids. I even pray before I eat. I even do it in restaurants because I don't care. I'm not ashamed. And they justify all these things that they do. And what they're doing is they're building themselves up to make themselves look spiritual and feel good inside. And so then they say, but I don't really need to give up this smoking thing. They ignore the conviction that God's putting in their heart because of all of the good things that they are doing. And what they're doing is they're making the God out to be what they want them to be. That's a scary thing. Thou shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment, not amendment. Thou shall have no other God before me. And so that was just one example. And I think that we all kind of play those games with ourselves when really we know that God said, be holy as I am holy. God said, be sanctified. Come out from among them and be separate and leave the things of the world in the world. Quit picking up the garbage and the nonsense and the things that they play with and the things that they took. This is what happened to Israel over and over and over. They took wives from pagans and people that they weren't supposed to and they defiled the whole camp and the whole group of them. And before they knew it, they couldn't figure out why we're back into sin, why we've gone from God and we've forsaken him. How did we get to this place? I remember the good old days when God was alive in my heart and things were going well. But see, we allow the enemy to manipulate us and we allow our own selves to manipulate ourselves and to make God what we want him to be. And this is exactly what this generation is doing out there in the streets when they form their own truths. And they say, well, I love all people, and I think men should be with men and women should be with women and people groups can love each other and to each their own and I won't judge you if you won't judge me. And on the surface, it looks all warm and cozy and like it's some kind of like evolution of love, like we've achieved some height of something new. Like this looks like really wise and, and everything. But what happens on tomorrow morning when your cousin calls you and says, 
hey, I, today I woke up and I, 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 I'm identifying as a pedophile. I like small children today. Little boys and little girls. Well, this is the truth that they're standing on. These genders that they have going on, you get to pick and choose your gender and what you want to be now. Not a male, not female. Of how I feel in the morning. Well, there are mornings I wake up and I might feel, I don't know, like a cartoon character. Whatever I might feel like. I might feel sick. I might feel tired. I might feel awful. What am, so we get to choose now what I want to identify with? And now kids at five and six years old are being allowed to, to encourage to have sex changes or take the hormones without telling the parents. Do you know what kind of psychological damage that's going to do to a kid when they hit puberty? Yep. That's child abuse. Yeah. But it's okay. It's funny, though, that all of these half-truths, which are a lie, and making up their own truths and, and, and this evolved kind of love, and we can do this and do that, but I'll tell you right now what's going to happen to the LGBTQ+. I got it. And what's going to happen to any one of these gender-confused people when pedophilia comes out is, I was born that way. It's coming. That's coming next. Mark my words. Mark my words. And they will not accept it. Why? Well, now you want to stand on a truth? Now you want to stand? Because everyone knows that it's filthy, and everybody knows it's perverse, and everybody knows that whether they believe in God or not, it's evil and it's wicked. We all know it, right? But it's okay for men with men and women with women, and God only knows whatever other things they're doing. That's all tolerable and okay, but the minute we stepped over it, yeah, because they're children, so what? What's going to stop those people? Are we going to protect them and their rights so that we empower them and celebrate them? Maybe we'll make a month for pedophiles. Is that what's coming next? I, don't, I believe it's coming. 1 Corinthians. Now yeah, we're not going there. I already said it. You can go to Hebrews 10. What we have just done when we justify our sins if we've made a God before God. Yep. We've become a God, to, almost a God to ourselves. We've replaced God with being our own God. This is what the world really is doing. There's a part of this story that I would have liked to have preached, but I, I, couldn't, I didn't put it in the notes, and it'll be another time, but the Tower of Babel, and I may have hit on this before, but after the flood, remember God destroyed, he was sad that he made mankind, and he sent the flood and saved Noah and his family. Well, generations and generations and so many years after that, I don't have the calculation. We see the people of the earth, obviously all Noah's descendants, but all the people of the earth came together to build the Tower of Babel. And they were building something that they said, if we can reach into the heavens. And God said, look what man can do if we leave them alone, basically. Look what they can do. And it's in my belief that's what's going on today. They want no such thing as God. They've rejected and pushed him out of, in, in our culture, out of everything. Out of school, out of work, out of commercials. I mean, we get to see some things where God's still in it, movies and things that Christians are making. But for the most part, if they had their way, God would be shoved out of everything. Yep. Now at the Tower of Babel, I may have said this to you before, they weren't just building a building into the heavens. There was some ungodly witchcraft and evil going on in that hour. It wasn't God was not concerned if they could reach to the sky or into the clouds. We have buildings like that today. If he was concerned about that, then he would deal with it today. But here we have skyscrapers all over the place. But they were opening a portal or doing something of an ungodly sense, an ungodly evil, that God saw this was, it wasn't good. And so he smite them and he changed all their language so they couldn't communicate anymore. And so they couldn't talk to each other, so they got scattered throughout the earth. He put an end to that, didn't he? Amen. Creating gods. God hates sin. Do we know that? Yeah. That's another justification. This is happening throughout all of Christendom. And our seeker-sensitive churches, God bless them. I hope they all make it to heaven, and I hope they're not judged for the way they're teaching. I hope they all, all of them know Christ and make it. But in some of the churches that are out there, we are justifying our sin, and we're teaching things just like that, that God doesn't hate sin. 
God, God's not demanding holiness. God's not saying that you should be separate and to come out from the world. We could have it all. We can come to church and, and it can all be buttered up together like some kind of big piece of cinnamon toast. I love cinnamon toast. Does anyone else like cinnamon toast? <laughs> I'm here to tell you, and I think you already know this, that God has not changed his mind. God has not moved his position. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That doesn't mean that God doesn't love us in unique ways and that he doesn't reach into our lives in strange and unusual ways and places and whatever we find ourselves in. He's able to do whatever he wants, but when it comes to his principles, and when it comes to his law, and when it comes to his character, he changes not. He will not change, especially for any man. And so the more and more we hear about this culture and the things that they're trying to do, and the more we hear about a sinful church or, or churches that are making excuses and watering down the word and saying that you can have your cake. You know what? There are churches now. Maury showed me something the other day. You Google anything. Not only homosexual preachers and pastors in the pulpit, but now we've got transgender, we've got, uh, what are, I don't even know what they're called, he, she's, and she, he's, and everything else in the pulpit. And the desolation of abomination has set himself up in the temple. And the Bible says, when you see the desolation of abomination set himself up in the temple, know that the hour is near. Now, we scholars think that it happened when it was Nero or I don't know who came in and defiled the temple, the real temple, and poured pig's blood out on the altar. And there's some real story to that. But in the spiritual sense, when you see the desolation of abomination erecting himself in the temple, into the churches and into Christendom, into the kingdom, that's what we're seeing all over the world right now. And all of the signs and all of the warnings have already happened. There's probably not a prophetic word, really, maybe one or two, that needs to pass before Jesus, I mean, he could come right now. And yet people are still playing with God. Now, I don't know if they're purposely playing with God, if they're really that ignorant. That I, I don't know if they're just, do they have blinders on? Has God shrouded them that they can't see truth? And this person that I was talking about in the post, we actually had pretty good dialect. It wasn't, we weren't fighting or anything like that, but other people chimed in and there was some real discussion. But we can't water down and change and create our own truths. And the same way that we think it's so simple for us to see the truth, this person said to me, why isn't it, why isn't it just a light bulb moment for you? Why can't you just have an aha moment and know that we should just love everyone? And that men, and this is what they said, like it, they think it should be that easy for me. And I tried to explain the, the, the ground on which I'm standing as a Christian. I have to hold the line. Amen. We have to hold the line. Because if we don't, we've lost it all. Hebrews 10, 28 through 31. It says, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. It's interesting because these are the exact verses that those seeker-sensitive churches will never touch. They'll never say this, read this, or preach this in their pulpit. That's powerful. I'll say it again. How much worse punishment do you suppose? Now, this is talking to every Christian, every person like you and I. Well, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood, Jesus' blood, of this covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace, which is this Holy Spirit? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. By the way, this is New Testament. They said, we're, well, we're under grace, pastor. The Old Testament was law and we're under grace. This is New Testament. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So in our exploration, I should say in the world's exploration of what is love, as they're trying to find truth, or as they're 
think that they know what love is and they're building and creating their own truths, whatever you want to call it. I think as Christians, we know what love is. No greater love than this that a man lay down his life for another. And Jesus, we know our Lord, laid down his life to redeem us. Now, 1 John 4, 16 says that God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. God is love. Now, I'm going to read to you what I wrote the other day on that post. It says, Many people are searching for God today, but unfortunately, many are searching for the God that they would like him to be. People fail to understand that if anyone wants to know God, they need to draw near to him on his terms. We cannot conveniently manipulate and change God to fit into our lifestyle or what we choose to believe rather than believing in the truth. And God is love, and no one can come to God outside of the way that he made for us. You guys are all familiar with John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So here lies the problem of the hour. Everybody wants love or God because God is love, but they want love on their terms. They want it outside of truth. And here's the thing. You cannot have love outside of truth. All in the same, you cannot experience truth outside of love. God so loved the world that he sent his son. So we're experiencing the love of God through the truth of God, which is Christ. God is love, and the only way to God is through Christ. Jesus is the truth, which reveals and reconciles you to God. We're living in a culture where people are making up their own belief systems as they go. They're not standing on any foundational truths, much less any kind of a firm foundation. The Bible teaches us that if we build our house on sand, anything other than the rock, which is Christ, it'll easily be washed away or crumble. Now, I, for one, I don't know why it's so difficult for people to understand that they cannot make up their own rules. But as we watch this culture and as we watch this society continue to evolve evil, evolve evolution, right? And they continue to make up their own standards and they continue to make up their own precepts. They continue to make up all their own rules and all their own regulations. It often causes me to wonder what's right and what's wrong. According to their sayings, there is no right and wrong. You don't hurt me, I won't hurt you. You don't hold me accountable, I won't hold you accountable. Love all, love is free, love all. It was kind of like back in the hippies. The hippies kind of started this stuff. Free love, right? That was their thing, free love. And actually we're going down and down and down. And here the church stands before this world as it continues to spiral like an airplane spinning out of control. We're standing as a beacon of hope and as a beacon of light. It's so, so important that we don't falter, that we don't lose hope, that we don't water down the word, that we don't try to change the words that are in the Bible, that we don't try to change God, his character, who he is, but that we uphold and uphold and, and adhere to the truth which is in God. Amen? Amen. I already said my last notes. To each their own. That was my last sentence. To each their own. I hate that. To each their own. Unless it involves small children. You've heard me say that, I actually don't like this saying either, everything in moderation. I used to say accept adultery. <laughs> you got to be careful what we fall into. Right. These sayings in the world are all meant to drag us down into the mire, drag us down into the mud. But the scriptures, the richness of the truth which is in the word of God 
as we continue to dig in and to read and to study, and as God just awakens and quickens our spirit to it, lifts us out of this world system and places us in seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So important that we wash our minds with the regener- regenerate our minds with the washing of the word. It's not going to get any prettier. It's not going to get any easier. It's not going to get any simpler. It's going to deteriorate. It's going to get worse. And we have to hold on. And we have to stir one another on to good works. Amen? Amen. So, the way, the truth, and the life is? Jesus. Jesus. And God is? Love. Love. The two kind of go hand in hand. They ultimately go hand in hand. We are not empowered to make up our own truths, our own belief systems. It's all laid out right in front of us in the word. Now we go out into the world and we love them and we share with them the word of God. And you know, the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It separates the spirit from soul and bone from marrow. I mean, and it it exposes the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So when you get into a debate in love, when you get into a debate in love and you bring the word into it, it cuts these people to the quick in a good way. I don't mean that. that sounds harsh, but it cuts them open and exposes what they're, what they're believing and shows them the lies. And there's no refuting it. They, they don't really have words anymore. And a continually kind of hitting the, hitting the, the coconut, eventually it'll crack. Amen. And so we need to be consistent and love these people and push up against the world. Amen? Amen. That's all I got for you. I hope it was okay. I hope you enjoyed it. Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we're so thankful that you're with us. We need you more and more in our lives, God. And, and I personally, I want to just say, God, forgive me. And I pray for everyone here, forgive us, God. If we've ever made an idol out of anything, God, if we've ever watered down the word or justified our actions in any way and created our own little God the way that we would want him. Lord, our heart is to come after you and to know you and to serve you with all of our heart and all of our being and all of who we are. And I ask God that if there's anything that would hinder that, that, that chasing after you, that your spirit, Holy Spirit, please reveal it to us. As we leave out this church today, just quicken us and awaken us to anything, God, that would hinder our relationship so that we can deal with it swiftly, Lord, and get rid of it. So we say we're sorry, we love you, and we thank you that you care and you love us and you chasten and you encourage and you equip us. And just, I ask God that you do that for every person here. Bless them this week, Lord. Let them be ever conscious, Lord, of your, of who you are and all the things that they do. And help them to make every decision, Lord, based on the spirit of the living God. And how it would offend or cause you to rejoice, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Have a great week. Enjoy the heat. Thank you.